Again, thanks for being here. My name is Brian Culbertson. I am the teaching pastor currently at Refuge. Last week, we had a season finale. We had a cliffhanger in the book of Samuel. Samuel chapter 8, Israel said, we want a king. And God said, you got a king, but I'll give you one anyway if you want. So it's kind of this cliffhanger. I don't know if you binge watch a lot of TV or not, but you know, there's these cliffhangers and then you got to wait for that new season to start. So that's kind of the point between chapter eight and chapter nine. And this week is kind of like the start of a new season. And you know, when the new season starts, everybody's got new haircuts. You're like, where did those come from? And then they pick up in this new location and it's like a new season. So we're going to continue the series, Monarchy of Misfits, but we're going to pick up in a new season. This is a time of major transition for the people of God. They've now gone from Eli the priest to Samuel the judge, and now a king has been promised by God. And so within the kingdom of Israel, there is excitement, but there's probably some fear. There's some uncertainty. And how we deal with times of transition as individuals, as families, as churches, or even as nations reveals a lot about what we believe and in whom we believe. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 9. You probably know this when it says, we can make our plans, but the Lord determines our steps. We've been doing homework as a church, and this week you were supposed to read 1 Samuel chapter 9 and verse 10. Proud of everyone who has been reading. That is awesome, and I'm so honored that we are doing that as a church. And so chapter 9, the new season, is going to begin tonight, if you read it, with a story. It's a story about some guy that is out looking for his lost donkeys. Now, if you haven't read this, spoiler alert, the story is actually not about the donkeys. Why don't you say that with me right now? Say, it's not about the donkeys. It's not about... You can tell we are not a charismatic church because you guys did terrible (laughs) at that. We're going to practice that a little bit tonight. We're going to talk a little bit. Doctrine of Providence. Have you heard of that before? The doctrine of providence, that God made the universe, God upholds the universe, God directs the universe. There's a couple of foundational principles then that underline this idea that have to be there, that God is good. In fact, the Bible says God is perfectly good, that God is unchanging. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And as we just sang, God is love, a love so deep That were the oceans filled with ink and the skies made of paper and every tree a pen and every person a writer, we still, whoops, could not express, ouch, the love of God. And so when we talk about providence, the providence of God, that's the foundation. That God is good, that God is love, that God is and has and will always be working things out for the good of those he loves. And so last week, God promised Israel a king. And God cannot break a promise. He is going to bring forth a king. Without that unchangeable nature, God ceases to be God. God never says, you know what? I messed up there. I changed my mind. Let's do it this way now. It's not God. And yet, man within that scope of God is allowed to think, is allowed to act freely. Because without free will, mankind ceases to be human. We would be machines. We would be like those bots. I don't know how these things work that crawl around the internet and do stuff, but apparently they can hack a website unless you make them click on a picture that contains bicycles and they can't get in. (laughs) Somehow, our liberty, our freedom to make choices in life does not interfere with God's purpose. In fact, he uses our secondary causes from human free will to bring about that eternal purpose. And as believers, we should find comfort in this always, but especially in times of transition, times of hardship, and times of uncertainty. Without providence, there is no purpose to your daily activities. Without providence, there is no meaning to life. But with God's providence... The good, the bad, the ugly, the uncertain, the interruptions, the setbacks, the distractions, your wise choices, your foolish choices, even the daily grind is brought underneath the sovereign control of a good, loving, unchanging God. That's the foundation 
As we go into chapter 9, I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. We're going to go verse by verse. So verse 1, it begins, There was a wealthy, influential man named Kish from the tribe of Benjamin. He was the son of Abiel, son of Zeror, son of Bekaroth, son of Aphiah. His son Saul was the most handsome man in Israel. Doesn't it just sound like a kid's story? He's the most handsome man in Israel, head and shoulders taller than anyone else in the land. And so season two now of our series has begun. And how does this writer begin the season? With genealogy. Family history. Family history, whether we like it or not, plays a huge part in who you are, and that falls under God's providence. Our genetics, for Saul, it determined his looks. For us, maybe it determines our IQ or our personalities, what we are on the Myers-Briggs or our preferences or even our proclivity towards certain sin. Our family situations that we were raised in, they dictate certainly where we were born, how we were raised, where we went to school. Our initial worldviews were given to us by our parents or whomever raised us. And some in the room tonight, you may love your family background. It is a source of pride for you. And there's some in the room that probably hate their family background. It's a source of embarrassment or anger or resentment. Either way, It was no accident. It follows under God's providence. Acts chapter 17, verse 26, it says, From one one man, Adam, he made all the nations, that though they should inhabit the whole earth, and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their land. God placed you in your family for a reason. And he will use your genealogy, he will use your genetics, no matter how good or how bad, for his purpose and his glory. And so in the story tonight, Saul doesn't appear out of nowhere. It's not like, poof, here's your king, Israel. He's, He's here. Saul grew up. He has a family. Turns out it sounds like it's a wealthy family. It's a family with influence. Apparently, he does have some good genes. He's the big handsome. He's tall. He's strong. And so right away, if you're reading this as a story and and the prior season ended with God promising a king, you're going to start this story off and you're like, here's the guy. He's good looking. He's tall. He's from a wealthy, influential family. This is the king. Verse 3, one day, Kish's donkeys, what, what, what? Kish's donkeys strayed away. And he told Saul, take a servant with you and go look for the donkeys. Now that sounds like a fun day, right? I get to spend the day walking around in the desert looking for lost donkeys. Better yet, my dad sent this servant with me that I have to now entertain. Or maybe this servant is here to keep tabs on me. But this is how God brings Saul to Samuel. There's no big banner in the sky saying, Saul, this way, that's where Samuel is. You need to go there. God simply uses everyday, mundane, routine situations. And so for Saul, this was a day that probably started out just like any other. He thinks he's going out to search for some livestock that once again have wandered off. But say it with me. Again, it's not about the donkeys. I challenged our youth Wednesday night. I'm actually leading those um, studies each week. And so I challenged them to think through a daily routine. And Faith was nice enough to take us step by step through her daily routine. And then the other youth were supposed to you know, comment and say how God might be at work at all those daily parts of their routine. And I want to challenge you to do the same tonight. Think about your daily routine. The interruptions, the grind, the frustrations... I think of frustration, I think of the carpool line at my kid's school. Or maybe it's the routine of showing up here every Saturday night, though some of you are better at that routine than others. Maybe it's the 7 a.m. session at the gym, or if your name is Scott, it's the 3.30 a.m. session at the gym is when he goes. Or maybe it's the same thing that you did Thursday, that you did also on Wednesday, that you did on Tuesday, that you did on Monday, that you're going to do all over again this coming week. Is God's sovereign hand guiding any of that routine? The answer is yes. Do we often see it while we're in the midst? And the answer is no, but sometimes years down the road, we can look back and see it. But does that mean we have to spend every waking moment trying to figure out what is God doing in this moment of my life? And that answer is Proverbs 20, 24. The Lord directs our steps. So why try to understand everything along the way? 
Yes, we should be mindful that God is at work. We should pay attention and not sleepwalk through life. It can help with some of the frustration. This week, my back is awful, and it helps me knowing that God can and will somehow use that for me and his purpose. But it can also be relaxing, and we can relax to know that we don't have to understand everything completely, that we don't have to look for a silver lining in every cloud to know that God is still at work in our lives. Verse 4, so Saul took one of the servants and traveled through the hill country of Ephraim, the land of Shalashah and Shalem area, and the entire land of Benjamin. But they couldn't find the donkeys anywhere. Okay, again, the book of Samuel is a story. It's a true story, but nonetheless, it's a story. That's how it reads. And so this can read a little bit like the three little pigs. They went here, and they huffed, and they puffed, and they couldn't find their donkeys. And so they went here, and they huffed, and they puffed, and they went there, and they huffed, and they puffed. And what's happening is the writer or writers are drawing us into the story. They want you to feel Saul's frustration as he looks for these donkeys. They want you to see that Saul thinks that this day is all about looking for donkeys, that he's unaware of what God is up to. He wants you to see the mundaneness of the circumstances. Verse 5, finally, they entered the region of Zuf. And Saul said to his servant, let's go home. By now, my father will be more worried about us than about the donkeys. Zuf. Any significance? Anyone knows I got $20 for you right now. I don't, but you don't know. (laughs) But think back. If you really were paying attention, 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 1. We started this series three weeks ago. It says there was a certain man, a Zephite, whose name was Elkanah, son of a name I couldn't pronounce, son of another name I couldn't pronounce, then the son of Zeph. Zeph is where Samuel was born. Saul has now entered Samuel's homeland. And so again, if you're reading this as a story, now there is intrigue. Now there is suspense. Now you should go, hmm, the search for donkeys has them exactly where God wants them. But Saul's ready to go home. He's concerned about his dad, maybe, but more than likely, he's just over it. He's like, okay, we looked. We couldn't find him. We're done. He can't see what God is doing in this frustrating circumstance, just like all of us. Verse 6, it says, but the servant said... I've just thought of something. There's a man of God who lives here in this town. He is held in high honor by all the people because everything he says has come true. Let's go find him. Perhaps he can tell us which way to go. Who is this servant? Don't know. What's this servant's name? Again, we don't know. How significant is this servant in the history of Israel? It's colossal. Without this servant, they would have turned around went home. And so, point, God works through the people he has around you. Church members, co-workers, your friends, maybe it's your server tonight at dinner. Maybe it's those little servants that we call children, though mine don't serve us all that well. All these people all play a part in moving you to where God wants you, which means then, in the reverse, we're playing a part in getting others to where God wants them. No matter how small, no matter how insignificant you might feel. Verse 7 says, but we don't have anything to offer them, Saul replied. Even our food is gone and we don't have a thing to give them. Here, again, spoiler, we're getting some insight to the rest of the story. We're getting some insight into this guy, Saul. He tends to give up easily. He tends to look for excuses. These attributes will carry over into his leadership eventually as a king. Verse 8 says, well, the servant said, I have one piece of small silver. We can at least offer it to the man of God and see what happens. Good thing he had that piece of silver with him. The story is about Saul indeed, and and that's what the writers intend. That's why we don't get the name of the servant. But as I thought about it this week, God is working just as much in this servant's life as he is in Saul's life. They are both his children and he loves them. And so the servant, he has a life. He has plans. He has ideas. He has thoughts. He has genetics. He has birthrights. There are areas in his life that God is trying to grow him. And so maybe he's been submissive his whole life as a servant. He's afraid to speak up. And God has just been stirring him. And God has just been working him year after year. And he's presented an opportunity, an opportunity to say something, an opportunity that providence has provided him in that moment. And he seizes 
the divine moment. He says, all right. Saul agreed. Let's try it. Saul's like, let's do it. So they started into the town where the man of God lived. As they were climbing the hill to the town, verse 11, they met some young women coming out to draw the water. So Saul and his servant asked, they must have said it at the same time, is the seer here today? It's my favorite line of this whole thing. Is the seer here? Say it with, is the seer here? It's great rhyming, I guess, happening there. But let's talk about these women. Going to get water is a daily household chore, right? It's routine. But is that routine insignificant? Well, not this day and not oftentimes in the Bible. Genesis 24, Abraham's servant stops and meets Rebekah, who eventually becomes the wife of Isaac. In Genesis 29, uh, Jacob meets Rachel, his future wife, at a well. Exodus chapter 2, Moses meets his future wife at a watering hole at the well. And so these young women, they're coming here, and they're coming to the well, and they're like, all right, here we go. I see a couple of guys. It's it's wedding time, and they see these two guys, Brad Pitt and Jonah Hill. That's exactly what they see. (laughs) Big, handsome, and, you know, the other guy. And they start fighting over, like, which, which, who gets Brad and who gets Jonah? (laughs) Of course, the Bible also tells us that God does more than set up romantic encounters at the well. Uh, the first person to proclaim the good news of Jesus, you know who that was? Is the woman Jesus met in Samaria at the well. And she talks about her past and her present, and she goes home proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. First person in Scripture to do that, this woman at a well. Going to a well, getting the water. It's like doing the laundry, okay? It's boring. It's routine. But those circumstances then bring about God's eternal purpose. Verse 12 says, Yes, these ladies agreed. Stay right on this road. He is at the town gates. He has just arrived to take part in a public sacrifice up at the place of worship. God's timing is perfect. If those ladies hadn't shown up at just the right moment, Saul wouldn't have known that the seer was here. An hour later, it'd be a different story. If Samuel had just no happened not to have arrived in town, if it was a day earlier, Saul would have missed him. I don't know about you, sometimes in my life the timing feels off, like it doesn't move how I expect it to move. I like resolution. I don't like a lot of stuff spinning out there that are unresolved. I hate open-ended situations. I want the timing to change. Or sometimes in timing, God drops stuff into my lap that I'd rather not have to deal with right now because the timing is not good. Our timing may feel off. But we rest in knowing that God's timing is impeccable. So if we think about all this providence stuff, then it's kind of mind-boggling, right? That God was at work in your family tree. That God is at work in the interruptions in your life. That God is at work in the setbacks of your life. That God is working in the people around us to work through us. That God is at work in the timing of even the most ordinary of events. But we wake up. We go, you know, tomorrow's Sunday, we Sabbath, and Monday comes around, and it feels like Groundhog Day. You've seen the movie. 6.30 a.m., the alarm goes off. It's time to make the coffee because you forgot to make it the night before. It's time to take the shower. It's time to sit in traffic. It's time to go to work. It's time to deal with all the problems that come with work. And then it's time to get the kids to soccer. And then you come home, and it's time to crash on the couch. And it's time to veg out and watch Ted Lasso, which is a great show. And then you wash, rinse, and repeat, and you do it all over. And it's just this routineness of of life, but all the while, in every one of those mundane, routine moments, God is at work. He's at work in your lives. He's using you to work in the lives of others, and most of all, working every human choice to bring about His eternal purpose. Say it with me. It's not about the donkeys. Getting better. Verse 15, now the Lord had told Samuel the previous day, About this time tomorrow, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin. I don't know what mess you've gotten yourself into lately. I do know you're in one because we all have gotten ourselves into some sort of mess lately. But whatever mess you're in, God's not like, well, crap. Brian's done gone and messed it. God's not a redneck. Brian's done gone and messed it up (laughs) this time. I don't know why I said it like that. (laughs) How in the world... Am I going to clean up this mess that Brian made? God's plan for you, God's plan for your life preceded 
preceded the circumstances that you are in today. God's plan preceded your present mess. He's already worked through it. He already knew you were going to get into it. So just pray, talk to him, seek his will for that next step, and then trust him to take whatever that step is. Verse 16 says, anoint him to be the leader of my people, Israel. He will rescue my people from the Philistines. For I have looked down on my people in mercy, and I have heard their cry. God's plan is bigger than me. God's plan is bigger than you. Saul thought he was out looking for donkeys, but God had a bigger plan. Saul's servant thought he was just along for the ride, but God had a bigger plan. The ladies at the well thought they were just getting the water, but God had bigger plans. Three times God emphasized in that verse, my people, my people, God's providence is bigger than you and it's bigger than me. It wraps around all of mankind and all of human history. Verse 17, when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said, that's the man I told you about. He will rule my people. God tells us what we need to know when we need to know it. And I know it would be a lot nicer if we just get it all up front. Like, how exactly is, is all this going to work out, God, in my life that I'm going through now? But that's generally not how God operates. Because there's this little thing called faith and trust. And so we take comfort, though, in knowing when you need to know, God will be sure to tell you. Verse 18 says, Just then Saul approached Samuel at the gateway and asked, Can you please, this first time they're meeting, can you please tell me, where the seer's house is, is the seer here? Verse 19, I am the seer. Samuel said, go up to the place of worship ahead of me. We will eat there together, and in the morning, I'll tell you what you want to know and send you on your way. What does Saul want to know? Where's the donkey? Say it with me. It's not about... That's right. Verse 20 says, don't worry about the donkeys. They've been found. I'm here to tell you that you and your family are the focus of Israel's hope. Comes out of left field for Saul. I mean, he's an Israelite. I would imagine that somehow news got to him that the people have asked for a king. Maybe his family was rooting for the people to get a king. Maybe they've heard that God has promised a king. Perhaps on this journey, he and his servant have been tossing out ideas, speculating, I wonder who it could be. But never in a million years does it cross its mind that it's him. That God would have kingly aspirations for little old Saul. What about you? Does God have kingly aspirations for your life? He does. I mean, Christ died to make you a child of God. We're all kings and queens in waiting. That's what the Bible says. Genesis 2 says we were meant to rule over creation. Romans 8 says we are co-heirs with Christ who is the king. 2 Timothy says we're to endure so that we can reign with Christ. Revelations 1 says he has made us a kingdom of priests. No matter how much it feels like you're just looking for donkeys, the Bible speaks to God's kingly intent for your life. Verse 21, Saul replied, But I'm only from the tribe of Benjamin the smallest tribe in Israel. And my family is the least important of all the families in that tribe. Why are you talking like this to me? God's plan for Saul, you're going to be the king. Saul's response, I'm not important enough. Our response, you're going to be a king. Our response, don't you know what I've done? Don't you know how weak I am? God, don't you know there are better options? For you to choose. Verse 22, then Samuel brought Saul and his servant into the hall and placed them at the head of the table, honoring them above the 30 special guests. There are a lot of important people here. Put Saul at the head of the table. He doesn't just pull out a few chairs. He doesn't sit them over at the kiddie table because, oh man, we didn't know you were coming, but let's pull a few chairs out. He puts him at the head of the table. He seats Saul in a position of honor. Verse 23, Samuel then instructed the cook to bring Saul the finest cut of meat, the piece that had been set aside for the guest of honor. We don't know God's plans for our lives, but we know this. When this season of life ends, meaning this time of earth, and when our next season of life in heaven begins, there is a seat waiting for us at a glorious feast with the Lamb of God. Some pretty important people. 
And so we end tonight with this final verse. So Saul ate with Samuel that day. We started tonight and said it was a day that started out just like any other. And I want to turn here now. I'm no longer talking about Saul and his long lost donkeys. I'm talking about this day. Watch this. Hello, ma'am. He's sending all of my units to the Ferrazano Bridge. I don't know what's going on. What's going on, please? Do we have any available units? Any available units? We just had a, a plane crash into a floor of the World Trade Center. The World Trade Center, tower number one, is on fire. The whole outside of the building was just a huge explosion. We have a number of floors on fire. It looked like the plane was aiming towards the building. It is a hard hat operation. I still have to be fly through the air and I want to avoid anyone getting hurt. It's a hard hat operation. Send every available ambulance, everything you got, to the World Trade Center now. day that started just like any other became a time of uncertainty for many of us, became a time of hardship for our country, became a time of transition. It's a terrible, awful day. But if you're going to believe the doctrine of providence, that God is sovereign and in charge of everything, then it has to cover everything. The good, the bad, And yes, even the unimaginable. Every person in this room, I guarantee, remembers where you were at that day. I think everybody in the room is old enough for that, except for the teenagers that are in the back. You know where you were when you found out that that first plane had hit the tower. And then when you realized it wasn't just some idiot driving his plane into the side of a tower, but it was an attack on America. You remember the surrealness, the chaos, the confusion, the heartache, all those emotions that you felt, and then 3,000 Americans lost their lives in a single day. Over the last couple of weeks, I've watched a dozen or so documentaries about 9-11 because it did something. It stirred something in me when it happened. Every single one of them start out, every one of those documentaries start out with that line, it was a day just like any other day. A day in which God's sovereign hand was still at work. A day in which providence was still at play. A day that's still not about the donkeys. And let me be clear, God did not cause those horrible events. Human free will and most of all evil and sin caused those terrible tragedies. But God can use even the worst of human evil for his eternal purpose. And so as I watched the documentaries and I reflected that day, we were reminded as a nation that heroes do exist. The firefighters who were running in as everybody else ran out. Those heroes on Flight 93 that made unimaginable decisions very quickly. We were reminded that we could actually be united as a people. Man, we just came through a terrible election where we didn't believe who won actually won. All kinds of turmoil and trauma, and that day happened, and what do you know? We united together as people. As the days followed and the tragedy unfolded, we're also reminded of the beauty of little things. I told our kids today that the news was on, I think, for like 25, 30 days after. There were no TV shows. Friends went off the air. ER wasn't on anymore. It was nonstop, 24-7 coverage of 9-11. But in that coverage, we saw beautiful things. We saw joy in community. We saw that it is worth taking time to remember loss, that sacrifice is definitely worth honoring. Did God work in the lives of those who were there that day? Because we know it impacted us, but what about those who were there? As the guys who survived stairwell B, ask them, about their new appreciation on life. And if you don't know, the tower came down. They're in this one little stairwell. They're coming down. And the lady, the firefighters are bringing down. It's like, I can't make it. I can't make it. I need to stop. And so 
in God's providence, they stopped for a moment, and just this one little piece of that stairwell survived as the tower came down and crashed, and they were rescued. Ask them about their appreciation of life now. Or ask the two brothers I heard about. They were both firefighters, and they both just assumed that each other had died in their respective towers because they weren't together. And as they're mourning and they're grieving and they're going through finding other people, they see each other. Ask them now about their appreciation of family. One guy on the Today Show this morning, he was asked, how often do you think about 9-11? He was in the tragedy. He says, I think about it every day because I'm still able to breathe. How did God use 9-11 in your life? I'll share mine. I was 26 years old at the time. I thought I was pretty indestructible. I was pretty arrogant still. And for the first time, I had to really process. First time in my life, I had to process pain and suffering and evil and death. And I remember just thinking as the news continued to play about the impermanence of life. And I had this existential crisis that all the security that I thought I had, it was all an illusion. And I began to think about right and wrong and why I even felt like there was a difference between right and wrong. Was there a moral authority that made that determination? And so looking back, you all know I haven't been a Christian my whole life and I wasn't then, but I believe that God was using that moment to draw me towards him. I didn't become a Christian until four or five years later, but he was opening my heart to hear and accept the gospel. Providence. Some of the stories I heard this week, one man survived because his son started kindergarten that day and he had to run him to school before he got to the tower. One man survived because it was his turn to bring the donuts and he had stopped to get donuts. One woman survived because her alarm clock didn't go off that day. One was stuck on the New Jersey turnpike because there was an accident. Another person's car couldn't start, so they weren't there. One couldn't catch a taxi. This one, he got a blister because he had bought new shoes the day before. He was wearing those new shoes, and he needed to stop at a drugstore to get a Band-Aid, and he is alive today because of that. Frustrations, setbacks, mundanes, providence at work. Here's one last statistic. In the aftermath of 9-11 in New York City, there was a growth spurt of Christians 20 to 40 percent increase in church attendance. Redeemer Presbyterian, who um, Tim Keller is the pastor there, I listen to just about weekly. Uh, his church grew from like 15 or 1,800 members to over 3,000 members in the two years that followed because of their outreach to the community during 9 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12. This is the wedding verse that we all know. You know, love is patient, love is kind, but here's where it ends. Paul says, now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then, in the next life, we will see everything with perfect clarity. And that I know now, all that I know now is partial and incomplete. But then, I will know everything completely, just as God now knows me completely. Love that verse. Isn't it a coincidence that tonight... As a church, we just so happen to be in chapter 9 of 1 Samuel on the anniversary of 9-11. That God gave me a sermon this week to just fit perfect with the events of 9-11. Or isn't it just a coincidence that you happen to be here tonight, this moment? It's not about the donkeys. One day, the Bible says it's all going to make sense. We'll see it clearly. All the little pieces of the puzzle will fit together together. And man, we'll be in awe of how God took our mistakes, of how God took evil, of how God took the carpool line, and he used it all. The Bible is full of stories of God's providence. It's splattered throughout its pages. Esther, you know the story, for such a time as this, she's there for a purpose and a time. We're going to get to the story of David. And he just is there with the David and Goliath fight because he was told by his dad to take a sandwich to his brothers so they'd have something to eat. And we know the story of David from there. Joseph, back in Genesis, his brothers hated him. They hated his dreams. They hated everything about him. They throw him in a pit. They try to kill him. They leave him for dead. And Joseph says, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. And it became the salvation of a nation. The entire story of the Bible, of God's word, is about God's providence and how it brought us salvation through Christ Jesus. A child born with a very specific genealogy, born at a very specific point in time. A child that God had worked out every step of his life in advance. 
God working through the people around him, both for his good and also through those who hated him. God's impeccable timing in that story. A plan that God had had in place since the beginning of time, before even the fall. And just when Jesus needed to know, God revealed to him the cross. I'm going to ask the band to come up. As we close tonight and we sing, man, don't lose sight of God in your daily grind. Don't get so frustrated with his timing or lack of answers. Don't give up on God when things don't go like you think they should. Providence brought us the cross. And while the cross doesn't answer all of our why questions, we're still looking through that dimly lit mirror. It certainly redirects our questions to the only answer that can give any sort of peace in this world, that can give any sort of hope, and that is the King of Kings. The one in charge, no matter what happens. The one who stepped down from his throne of eternal glory to display his love, to display his goodness, to show us that eternal plan on a cross. The one that has invited us to sit at that table and eat with him for eternity as he calls us his sons and daughters, his princes and princesses, his kings and queens. Won't you stand? Let's praise that king. Father God, we thank you so much for salvation. We thank you that you freely give it to all those who believe. Jesus, we worship you. We trust you. In Jesus' name, we pray all these things. Amen. Again, thank you for being here tonight. If you need prayer, if you want somebody to pray for you, for whatever it is you're going through, after the service, to my left, so you're right, over in the corner there, a few people will be standing, and they will pray with you, pray for you, uh, anything. It can be unspoken, or you can give specific requests, but we want to pray for you. If you're new here tonight, and you want to get to know a little bit uh, about Refuge, I'll be over there as well, so I'd be happy to chat with you. Uh, don't forget, next week, if you show up here, unless you are in the group that has kids, because they are meeting here, uh, all the other groups, if you show up here, there'll be church, there'll be people, you'll just be in the wrong group. So next week, 918, community groups, the third Saturday of the month, we are passionate about getting each other into deep relationships and building those friendships. So look for an email by Tuesday. If you don't get that, it's brian at refuge.church and we will get you connected. Or if that's uncomfortable, just show up here. You can be part of the group. I'm leading the one here this weekend. And so you can stop here next week and we'll, you can be part of this group as well. This week, as you go through the routine, you get up, you make the coffee, and it's just so boring. Just allow that boredom of doing all those routines maybe to direct your thoughts to God this week. Just let the boredom remind you that this day, let's go, let's go uh, Southern Indiana style. It ain't about the donkeys, okay? The day is not about the donkeys. And so keep that in mind this week. Uh, pray for the families who today lost someone during 9-11 because I can't imagine how difficult this day must be for them, especially on the 20th anniversary. God bless. Love you all. See some of you next week, the rest of you in two weeks.